uh, we've done tons of research on our own. There's over 300 published peer reviewed research papers on heart math today. Um, and at the same time, we found things in the research literature that people just didn't know about, like this amazing nervous system we have in our heart. Next to the brain is the most complex part of the nervous system that we actually have. And it's sending information to the brain through a nerve pathway that starts out here and travels up and through the lower centers of the brain, continues on into the limbic system, which is where a lot of our emotional processing takes place, and then terminates all the way up in the neocortex, the highest perceptual centers of our brain. And as it turns out, brain function is critically dependent upon this information it's getting from the heart. So the discovery was really, in that regard, was that you know there's this two-way conversation going on. Brain is sending information down to the heart, controlling the timing of the heartbeat, but that's about it. The heart, in fact, is sending a lot more information back to the brain than it ever gets from the brain. And so there's this neurological closed loop conversation that's always going on between heart and brain and actually the rest of the body as well. Hello and welcome to Activating Greatness. I'm Nathan Crane, an award-winning author, documentary filmmaker, and health and wellness expert. And I'm Derek Crane, a certified personal trainer, health and fitness coach, and trainer of professional athletes. Each week, we broadcast new episodes with experts on life, health, fitness, business, and leadership to help you manifest the greatness that's already within you. Activating Greatness is about helping you live your life to your fullest potential and live with more meaning, purpose, health, and fulfillment. In this episode, we talk with Howard Martin about the science behind activating your heart's intelligence. We talk about the four communication pathways of the heart that were previously unknown, including that the heart actually has a brain of its own, and we talk about the heart's role in helping your body heal, creating higher performance in your business, relationships, and fitness, and connecting you to a higher purpose in your life. And we talk about heart maths technology for showing you exactly how much heart coherence you have and how to create more coherence in just minutes. Howard Martin is the executive vice president of HeartMath, co-author of the book Heart Intelligence, Connecting with the Intuitive Guidance of the Heart, and a steering committee member of the Global Coherence Initiative. This is truly a fascinating episode and you don't want to miss any of it. If you're new to the podcast, make sure to subscribe on iTunes or YouTube and share this episode with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also find Crane Factor on social media and follow us to stay up to date with all the new content we release each week. Also, we want to thank our sponsors for helping make this podcast possible for you. Performance tea is something both Derek and I drink and love. One thing we really like about it is that it's handcrafted in small batches and made of the best medicinal herbs. We're both huge believers and consumers of herbs and love the healing benefits that herbal medicine brings to the body. Go to performancetea.com and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount off your order. They have incredible teas for energy, focus, recovery, and balance. Again, that's performancetea.com and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount today. So let's dive into today's episode. Awesome, Howard. It is uh, really an honor to be here with you today. The work you have done over the last couple of decades has been instrumental in really bringing awareness uh, to the intelligence of the heart through the scientific research that you guys have been doing at, at HeartMath. And I think it's really fascinating. I know this interview is, is going to be truly eye-opening for a lot of people. Uh, your book, your technology, the work you guys have been doing has been really eye-opening for both of us. Um, and as you know, I've been following what you've been doing for, for a number of years now, and I'm still learning every time that I dive deeper into it. So I just want to say thank you so much for the work uh, you've done and continue to do, and thank you for being here with us on Activating Greatness. Yeah, well, Nathan and Derek, thanks so much for having me. It's good to reconnect again, and uh, I hope that everybody who's listening to our conversation enjoys it and gets something of value out of it. Absolutely. So I want to jump really far ahead in the introduction here, um, and then we'll we'll get back and have a little backstory um, because you you guys have discovered right something called the heart brain. The fact that we have 
a brain in our heart. And I think that's incredibly fascinating. Um, would love for you to elaborate on that a little bit. I think, I think what we discovered is the fact that it was discovered, uh, ah. which is interesting. You know, when we first started HeartMath, you know, we were introducing a heart-based system that we wanted to have mainstream impact tools, techniques, technology, and all of that. And we recognize, look, if we don't do hard a bit differently, it's going to get written off the same way it has been for a long time. It's soft, it's squishy, it's emotional, and all of that. And we knew that it wasn't. So we decided that we needed to build a bridge between the philosophical understanding of heart and daily life. We chose science to be the bridge. Now, when we started doing our own scientific research, what we found was is there was information scattered through the research literature that I call today a who knew, right? There was this whole field uh, called neurocardiology that was studying a nervous system in the heart. Well, who knew that? Who knew that the heart actually had a nervous system? And so there was a guy, you know, Dr. Drew Armour up in, in Canada who'd written a book on it. It's, you know, a very detailed scientific book. And there were these small scientific conferences actually on neurocardiology. I think what we did and what our researchers did very well and guys like me who are spokespeople were able to take and move forward with is tell them the story. Uh, we've done tons of research on our own. There's over 300 published peer reviewed research papers on heart math today. Um, and at the same time, we found things in the research literature that people just didn't know about. Like this amazing nervous system we have in our heart. Next to the brain is the most complex part of the nervous system that we actually have. And it's sending information to the brain through a nerve pathway that starts out here and travels up and through the lower centers of the brain, continues on into the limbic system, which is where a lot of our emotional processing takes place, and then terminates all the way up in the neocortex, the highest perceptual centers of our brain. And as it turns out, brain function is critically dependent upon this information it's getting from the heart. So... The discovery was really, in that regard, was that, you know, there's this two-way conversation going on. Brain is sending information down to the heart, controlling the timing of the heartbeat, but that's about it. The heart, in fact, is sending a lot more information back to the brain than it ever gets from the brain. And so there's this neurological closed-loop conversation that's always going on between heart and brain, and actually the rest of the body as well. You know what's really intriguing to me is... Um the fact that for thousands of years, our greatest uh, spiritual teachings that have come from many lineages from multiple areas around the world, all reference the heart, connecting to the heart, uh, heart-based emotions, right? In terms of healing, in terms of spiritual progress and growth and, and uh, overall health. And there's kind of this, I think, a delineation nowadays between people who can hear that and look at that and say, yeah, that's just all new age woo woo or whatever. And I think what's really intriguing is how uh, these discoveries are validating all that ancient wisdom that's, that's been around for, for so long. Yeah, I think that's a good way of characterizing it. I mean, all those references to the heart go back thousands of years and it's always talked about as being an essential part of who we are. It's been talked about as being intelligent. All those things have been there all along, right? that's what got me interested in heart in the first place. I mean, early in my life, I had an interest in personal growth, but I wasn't a touchy feely guy. I was a young gun rock musician, you know, and I was just trying to, to expand my awareness and consciousness and the heart stuff kept showing up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, well, you know, um, maybe I should take a deeper look at heart, see if there's anything there or if there's not, you know, and what I found was along with Doc Shouldery, heart mass founder and others is that, whoa, this is pretty interesting. You know, there's a lot to be gained from living a life where you put the values of the heart at the forefront of what you do. It leads to a lot of things in your life. And so, yeah, for thousands of years, it's been talked about. Our challenge when we started HeartMath was we were, you know, we started, you know, now 28 years ago, 1991, we had to recharacterize heart in a modern context. We had to take it out of that, you know, the old ancient understanding of heart and put it into something that would relate to the 20th and 21st century. I think we did a pretty good job of that. And science, again, was an important part of it. Without science, we wouldn't be in the places we've been in uh, because heart maths all over the world and in very, very mainstream organizations and applications globally. If it was just another heart-based thing out of California, it wouldn't have happened. So right. science was important. But it's not the only part of heart math that's important, but certainly without it, it wouldn't have the reach that it has today. So in, in the book that you co-authored, um, Heart Intelligence, I remember there's a piece in here that talks about 
um, the role of the heart in, uh, you, you had mentioned uh, something about the heart connecting, speaking to sending information to the brain. I believe there was four different functions of the heart, right? Can you talk more about that? Yeah, four communication pathways. The first yeah. one we've talked about, which is neurological. The second one is a biophysical uh, communication. Here's what that means. Uh, when you put your finger on your wrist, you feel your pulse. And that's actually a wave of energy that's created by the squeezing of the heart muscle. And that wave of energy is what pushes the blood you know, through the veins and the arteries. And that's called a blood pressure wave. Well, you know, the heart changes rhythm all the time. And as it changes rhythm, the blood pressure wave changes. Now, blood pressure waves go throughout our entire system. That's how blood's getting everywhere. And those changes in blood pressure wave influence other parts of the body. For example, the electrical activity in our brains is synchronized to changes occurring in the blood pressure wave. Mm -hmm. So as the heart's rhythms change, it changes what happens up here. And that's a biophysical communication. That's the second way. The third one's another one of these who knew things. Uh, it's a biochemical communication. The who knew is this. In 1983, the heart was reclassified as being part of our hormonal system. Who knew that? The reason is, is because it produces some cool hormones. One of those is called atrial peptide. Uh, its job is to reduce the release of the stress hormone cortisol. I find that's pretty cool. You got a hormone being produced in our heart that's backing down a stress hormone. Another one it produces is called oxytocin, and many of the people listening to the broadcast today probably have heard of oxytocin. It's called the um, generic, it's called a love hormone. It's a regenerative hormone that's produced in greater amounts when we are in a loving state. Let's say a mother with a young baby, for example, is likely to be producing a lot more oxytocin. Well, the heart produces a lot of oxytocin. It's a very difficult hormone to measure, but indications are is that the heart may be the largest producer of oxytocin in our bodies. And that's your smart way, biochemical. So these first three ways I called, you know, hardwired biological communication path. Well just, to clar just to clarify real quick on the, on the hormones. So, yeah. um, so the heart actually is creating these hormones and distributing them throughout the body. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Oxytocin, atrial peptide, produces a couple of brain chemicals, dopamine, noradrenaline, all being produced by the heart as well as the brain in the other, the other glands. The, the old thinking was the brain created all that, right? The new thinking now is obvious that the heart produces a lot of that stuff as well. Yeah. Wow. Which, that's, that's again, the who knew thing. Right. Well, people figured that out back in the 80s. That's why the heart was reclassified as part of our hormonal system. But it was so, you know, so underpublished that who knew that, right? And that's your third way. So these three ways are well understood, well documented, well researched. Now the fourth way is where it gets really interesting to me. And that's the energetic communication. If you think about the heart, it's an electrical organ. It produces by far the strongest source of electricity in our bodies. When a doctor does our electrocardiogram, what are they measuring? Electrocardiogram. They're measuring an electrical signal produced by the beating heart. Well, it turns out that that's a, a lot of electricity being produced by the heart. So much, in fact, it creates an electromagnetic field around our body. Uh, that electromagnetic field surrounds us in 360 degrees, and it can be measured with conservative research equipment called magnetometers, about three to four feet outside the body. Mm -hmm. It's not an aura. It's not subtle energy. It's electromagnetic energy, like radio waves, like cell right. phone stuff. So you got this electromagnetic field surrounding us in 360 degrees. Well, the information in that field, the frequencies in that field are also changing all the time. And here's what changes them. Our emotions. When we're feeling frustrated, angry, irritated, judgmental, impatient, those kind of emotions, it produces a very incoherent field. It's called an incoherent spectra in the field. Conversely, if we start experiencing emotions that are related to heart, like care, love, compassion, patience, kindness, the field changes. It produces a more coherent spectra. Now, we are broadcasting this information out into space. And so the research today moves beyond biology and goes into physics. How does the field of the heart relate to the brain? How does my field relate to the field of another? How does the field between you and Derek, uh, what's being exchanged in that information right now? Then we take it further and we remove the boundaries of Newtonian physics and think about it from uh, quantum physics. 
And like, there's a feel going on right now between all of us that are part of this broadcast. There's a shared experience that's not bound by time or by space. You know, it's you and I, um, the two of you and me, but there's all these people listening and they're listening at different times in different places all around the world. But you know, there's a shared field experience that's happening right now. Mm-hmm. And this has a lot to do with heart. And so again, the scientific inquiry we have today is now into things like social coherence, we call it and global coherence. Mm-hmm. How are we creating, you know, new information in the larger fields through the thoughts and actions that we have moment to moment, day to day that are being broadcast by our hearts. That is so absolutely beautiful. And <laughs> you know, just, it really is. And you had mentioned just about social coherence. Yeah. Um, could you just ele- elaborate just on that concept, please? please? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're all in this together. You know, um, research today, ours and, and a lot of other people's is showing that they're, we're all connected energetically through this vast web of energetic connections that, you know, extends all around the planet and beyond. And so we're all having this shared life experience. And as we learn to work together more closely, we learn to respect the connections that we have with each other, we begin to create larger impact, Mm -hmm. positive change on every part of of life, including the earth itself. And so social coherence involves, you know, how do we align ourselves mentally and emotionally with one another? Mm -hmm. And that gets into things that go in the heart mass system, outside of just science, it gets into the tools and techniques, the attitudes and behaviors that we carry. And there's all kinds of groups of people. I mean, there's a family, you know, uh, you guys are brothers, you know, there's a family that's a group. There's, you know, spouses and wives and all that stuff and th- that are groups. There are groups in organization. Every company on the planet is a group, mm-hmm. you know, with a sense of a shared experience, a shared purpose. Uh, then you get into bigger groups like states and countries and all of that, you know, and then this is a global society. Uh, syncing this up better, learning to remove some of the barriers that show up in, in society through the biases, through the judgments, through the polarizations that we see so prominently today, and learning to meet more heart to heart, where differences are allowed uh, and respected in many ways, uh, but not necessarily have to be bought into, but that doesn't block the ability to, to communicate, to work together. We had a consultant here for many years, uh, consulting on finance, and he had a completely different set of values than I did. Political values, his whole life of interest values, all of us completely different. But we had the best time. <laughs> we, we resonated in a different way. It didn't matter what political interest he had or any of that stuff. Or we could just be as human beings together and enjoy each other for who we were. Now that can happen on much larger scales, and in fact it is. Uh, We are seeing on the news today, we're seeing all the bad stuff. We're seeing all the world's problems and differences on full display, amplified constantly over and over again. But I think you would agree, that's not the, that's not the total picture. Mm-hmm. Not even close. <laughs> not even close. You know, there's a whole lot of people doing amazing things around the world today, and they're coming together. And you know, there are a lot of ways in which they're coming together. Uh, certainly, the technology we have today, just like the technology we're using right now, allows us to connect mm-hmm. in different ways. There are shared interests that people are forming around. Some of the movements today, whether they're in a phase of angry or not right now, are actually bringing people together. Uh, whether it's, say, the Me Too movement, trying to really you know, balance out you know, a, a certain long-standing energy that needed to be balanced out, or other movements around eco- ecology or social injustice, you name it. There's all kinds of groups. And sometimes those groups, yeah, they're, they're loud and they're noisy and they're mad and they're upset. But at the core of it, they're coming from care. They care about something. And those, those movements will mature over time. But the people are coming together. And that's the, per, that's the point I'm making is it isn't all separate. It isn't all polarized. It's a, a shared experience people are having. And to me, going back again in what we talk about in the Heart Intelligence book is that heart has got a lot to do with all of that. The intelligence of the heart is what gives us the ability to make the choices about what we do, who we hang out with, our associations, the contributions that we're willing to make to the betterment of others and to society. All that information comes from making contact with that part of ourselves that we call heart. 
And when we meet heart to heart as human beings, the differences dissolve. They can still be there, be honored and respected, but they don't block the connection. They don't block the communication as much. And I think that's what's unfolding in the world today um, that gets unnoticed a lot uh, because we get so bombarded by all this stuff that, that looks like it's not that. Right. And so talking about some of the, the amazing things that can happen, the, the benefits, the healing, the, the stories, when we create that heart coherence, when we connect or activate our heart's intelligence, what are some of the things that you've seen and that you've seen through heart math that, that happen when we do this? Well, that's a great question, you know, and it's like, it's not just, an, not just heart math, but when you're in an organization like heart math, and it's about transformation, it's about putting information in many ways to, out to the world that can help people uh, through whatever challenges they have, or if they're not faced with any significant challenges to really, you know, master their craft, to be the best they can be, all of that. When you put that out in the world like that, and you do it as long as we have, you get so many stories back. It goes on and on and on. And this happens at HeartMath every single day here. And some of them are, are pretty crazy. I mean, some of them are like, you know, I, I read a, one of the HeartMath books. I practiced the techniques. I had a serious health problem. I don't anymore. You know, it goes into even the physical stuff. You know, relationships have been healed, major relationships. I mean, there was a, an example of a, a couple that was on the Dr. Phil show that were having terrible problems, and he told them that they probably needed to get a divorce. He was really hard on them. One of the things they do, we're doing back then, I don't know if they are now, but after a show like that, they would give them some assistance, and they contacted us and asked them, would we coach these people? Hmm. We did. We turned them on to, to the heart math techniques and to the heart math technology. Not only are they still married, they're extremely happily married. They are advocates of everything about this. They were able to get past the, these things that have been, I mean, their, their kids were even on that show saying mom and dad need to break up. You know what I mean? This is hell, you know, wow. and yet they were able to heal that. So relationships is another one. So health relationships, certainly in performance in business, uh, reductions of healthcare costs in major organizations from workforces that were trained in heart math and seeing, you know, measurable reductions. Uh, in many cases, uh, we've seen huge reductions in staff turnover. And these are all very measurable outcomes that we've seen. And the stories go on and on. The personal stories are better than the data, you know. And because I have the opportunity and honor to be out in the world as a spokesperson for heart math, I mean, I can't tell you, every time I go and speak somewhere, I have people, more than one, usually telling me, thank you so much, you changed my life. You know, heart math saved my life. I mean, I hear this stuff over and over again. Now, again, I'm not saying we're the only organization that hears that, but certainly we get our share of it. And so transformation, I think, in three ways is, is, would be the general themes of what I hear. One would be health. The other would be what we can generically call performance. And the third way is a change in a change in and an increase in awareness, uh, a deeper connection. Uh, it can even be uh, associated with a spiritual connection that has occurred in people uh, as they get in touch with their heart. And you know, Nathan and Derek, what I find interesting about it is it doesn't take as much as people think. Hmm. You know, we just have gotten to where we've lived life so fast. We live from the neck up. We cut ourselves off from the heart. And all we have to do is slow it down a little bit, return to this place right here to our own best friend. And for lack of a better term, magic can happen. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can 100% testify to that because, you know, I've been practicing variations of, of these techniques that I've learned over the years for over a decade now. And I can tell you that the most magical and incredible and unbelievable opportunities and, and um, you know, endeavors and encounters and things happen when I'm connecting to the heart, when I'm doing these practices. Actually, when we, um, when we did our vision and mission and core values with our company, Crane Factor, we actually did the, the, the technique of connecting to the heart and allow that to guide us in, in developing you know, what the foundation of, of our company is meant to look like. And I feel like one, definitely, you know, more intuition uh, comes naturally with, with these practices. But what I'm also really interested in, I think some of our viewers are interested in, is the science behind what actually happens 
to the body when we're connecting to the heart? I mean, you talked about the four different things, but what are some of the, the healing things or performance things that can actually happen? One of the major things that happens, Nathan, is that, you know, changes occur, rebuilding and resynchronization of what's called the autonomic nervous system. Mm. Uh, the autonomic nervous system influences about 90% of every bodily function that we have. And when it starts to go, a lot of other stuff, stuff will eventually go. Mm. And we've seen big changes in people really re-regulating that autonomic nervous system. Now, how does that play out? Well, first of all, I need to qualify this. We're on a live media show here is that we cannot make overt health claims. Uh, there are rules and regulations being placed in our country, which I think are important that it don't allow you to claim. If you do this, you'll get healed by that. You know, right. and the emphasis we always put in uh, to anything we say about health is, um, if you are seeing changes, if things are occurring that you didn't expect, please consult your doctor. Uh, let the doctor be the guide on whether medication is reduced and things like that. It's not hard math saying any of that. But areas we've seen big improvements are in are things like arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is the irregular beating pattern of the heart. I mean, when it just it just won't beat regularly, it just you know, it goes crazy in there, and it's very hard to regulate that. And medications usually used. There's been case after case after case of people that have come to us saying that by practicing heart math techniques, the arrhythmia went away, mm. or their medications were significantly reduced by their doctor. You know. And we've had, you know, other people, other authors and they've had this problem have gone public, you know, on national television telling the story about arrhythmia. Certainly, I think the, the area that we've seen probably the most results in terms of numbers of people would actually be mental health, which, as you know, has a lot to do with what happens to our physical health. But reductions in anxiety and depression would be two areas we've seen a lot of people see improvement. We, we do certifications is how we sort of expand. We certify other people, coaches, health professionals, trainers, et cetera. So there are, I think, about 30,000 health professionals in our database right now that are using heart math in some way. They're using our technology. They're using our techniques. Everything from uh, these mental health professionals at veterans and mental administrative hospitals down to private practice people, sports psychologists, all those people. And they're the ones on the front lines that are really getting the stories. And we get them after the fact about them saying things like, it's the most effective tool that I have for X. And they'll identify you know, a, a mental health situation that they use, uh, use heart math for. So I think improving the mental health of people has been one of the areas that's been, we've seen the most of and, and one of the, the things that I think is most important. As we know, anxiety and depression are a rampage in the world today. Uh, right. Many people are experiencing it. And if you are, and I mentioned that now, let me know I have compassion about that. There's no judgment in that. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's an interesting time to be alive and that stuff's going to come up. So many people do experience that. And, and I've said this before publicly, I don't have any data to back this up, but just in stepping back and observing life, I would say that uh, approximately one third of the people living in Western, in the Western cultures today is experiencing some form of low grade anxiety and depression. And the statistics on the amount of people that are taking medication to deal with that is off the chart as well. So I know it's out there. And if people can find a connection to their own heart and to the intelligence of the heart, a new level of self-security begins to emerge. A new level of, and feeling of empowerment comes with that. And with those tools, people can learn to move beyond some of these conditions that they have been suffering from for a long time. Some of the anxiousness and, and feelings of sadness and depression that you know, have ruled their life. And they have the ability to sort of rise above that. And with a little practice and over time, their whole perception about themselves, about others and about life itself can go through a big transformation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, if I look at what I want to have happen for people, that would be one of the, the core things is that people can rise above some of that noise and some of that dissonance that they're having inside themselves right now and find new, more hopeful, open-ended perspectives to be able to really um, enjoy and experience the gift of life and not see it as something we're just trying to get through. Yeah, it's so important. So many millions of people are suffering. I mean, I've, I've gone through depression in the past. I know what that what that feels like and and um, and it's not something that you know we would want to wish on anybody and I'm excited about this 
uh, process and, and the work that you're doing and the technology that you have from the standpoint of healing, as well as, uh, you know, Derek's a certified personal trainer. Um, also, you know, he's an athlete, he's, uh, boxing right now. Um, and, and I'm an athlete as well and I do CrossFit. And so, you know, from an athletic point of view as well, it's really interesting to me about how connecting with the heart can help the body recover and to repair itself. And it's amazing. Get yeah. better and stronger, right? Yeah. I'll use myself as an example. I mean, you know, um, time has moved on for me, you know, uh, I'm 69 years old now. I still feel like a little kid, you know, and sure, I can't run as fast or jump as high as I used to, but I'm still into lots of physical stuff. You know, in the last year, I've gotten into bicycles. Mm. And so I'm not a guy that's going to ride 50 miles, you know, <laughs> but I am a guy that can ride 10 <laughs> or 20, you know, and I do it all the time. And it's like, I feel like having the vitality and I've had none of the serious health problems, you know, I'm this, mm. this far down the road and I've got and none of these, no big hospital stays, none of the major stuff has hit me. Right. And honestly, you look like you're 50. So something's working. Just gonna say That's that. what I'm saying. It must be. <laughs> you know, I think, and I'm sure I eat a, I eat a balanced diet and I'm conscious about those things. And, and that's a part of it. But I have to say if I, whatever vitality I still have today, I have to attribute it to learning to live more from the heart. Mm. And you know, putting more love and care out not only to uh, to others but to myself, and it has the ability to regenerate. So hopefully, this knock on wood, it's going to stay that way for a while. But I feel vital, alive, and energized most of the time, uh, and I think it's got a lot to do with that again connection to the heart, the intelligence of the heart, and the benefits that come with that, right on down to physical benefits. So you have, or HardMath has this technology called Inner Balance, right? I actually have a device here. I've been using it. Yep. Um, attaches to the ear, and it connects to a really comprehensive app that you can download on your phone um, that I've been using and playing with and experimenting with. And I find it really interesting, um, and maybe you can help clarify that what this is measuring is actually the rhythm of the heart, not the heartbeat. Is that Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's taking a measurement called heart rate variability analysis, which is measuring the timing between heartbeats. Mm -hmm. It's not measuring a heart rate like a fitness monitor. Mm -hmm. It's measuring the timing between heartbeats. I mean, use my hands and maybe this will work. You know, when you go, when you see your EKG from the doctor electrocardiogram, you see there's this big spike, right? And then it load, reloads and then there's another spike, right? The spikes where the heart's pumping out. Well, between this spike and this spike, it might be 0.236 seconds or something like that. Or between the next two, 0.484. Between the next two, 786. There's this constant variance that's happening in our heart rate. It's supposed to do that. Uh, when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, your heart rate's 70 beats a minute, they just told you what the average was. The timing between those heartbeats is changing all the time. Now, Having a lot of variability is good, but you want to have variability that you can then put into certain patterns that really do generate heart-brain uh, communication, the release of regenerative hormones into the body, all the benefits we've been talking about. And when we get those heart rhythms to move in this smooth and ordered pattern, we do enter a state called coherence. In a coherent state, and there are a lot of athletic implications for this for you guys that are athletes, in the coherent state, all the major systems are synchronizing to the rhythmic beating pattern of the heart. That means digestion, respiration, immune system response, hormonal response, brain function, they all sync up and you're in this high performance state. So things like reaction speed times improve, mm -hmm. visual field widens. So it's right on down to physiological things and athletes so get trained all the time in heart math to increase their coherence levels gives them that little extra edge in, in whatever they're doing. Now, <clears throat> coherence also is psychological. It um, is triggered by sustained regenerative emotions. And once you hit that coherent state, those same type of regenerative emotions come easier to you. They kind of flow. Emotions <laughs> like gratitude and compassion, yeah. love, these things. That's right. right. The technology is called inner balance trainer. It is a, we have it in various forms, but you're using it on the mobile devices, which by far is the most popular today. So we were the first guys, first kids on the block to take heart rate variability, put it into consumer understanding and form factors, and then put it on mobile devices. 
So you, we have a very comprehensive app that's measuring high quality heart rate variability analysis. Nothing's not a toy, this is measuring the real thing. It has a patented algorithm in it that scores that heart rhythm pattern for how coherent it is and gives point assignments to it, a scale of which, you know, from low coherence to really super high coherence. And it measures all that, calculates it, reports it back to you. Uh, your device links to something called a heart cloud to where then you can see all of your practices over time. You can see the accumulation of coherence points over time. So people gamify it, I do. How many points do I want this week? How many points do I want this month? What's my the total amount of points I've accumulated in a lifetime of use? Mm -hmm. You know, so I play all those games out. And the way that it's used for, people use it all kinds of different ways. The way I use it is in my meditative practices. In other words, I don't have to have it to do heart focused meditation, but if I have it, then I'm actually gonna do more of it because it's, I'm gamified it. Mm -hmm. It also keeps me honest because it will, you know, you can say, well, I'm going to be in the heart, putting out love and care for the planet and all the people. And the next thing you know, you're doing that. But on the background, you start planning out a business meeting or you're griping about something you got to do, or you're pissed off about what somebody said to you yesterday. Well, that thing will show you real quick that you've lost that deeper heart. I, I, I want to say, I want to mention something because I tried tricking it a couple of times and I haven't been able to yet where I do the deep breathing yep. and do the connection but then i then i intentionally start thinking about something negative and i get the little ding or the little you know yeah. it goes to blue or to red and i'm like i haven't been able to trick it yet so breathing will trick it some but when you really want to go to this higher coherent states there's two things that really create coherence one is what we call heart focused breathing mm -hmm. it's just really breathing through this area of the heart breathing deeper than normal and imagining the breath is there and then and you can cheat it to a certain degree just by breathing. Breathing's good mm -hmm. anyway, and it will get you some pretty good scores just breathing. But if, to really get to the high coherence levels, you have to do that and then also feel one of those regenerative uplifting emotions. Mm -hmm. So while you do that, can you feel appreciation for the good things in your life? Mm -hmm. Can you feel the love and care you have for someone or something? Can you endure it, feel the love and care and the bond you have as brothers? You know, that kind of a feeling. They have to be this big gushy thing. It can be just a good old solid heart feeling. Mm -hmm. When you do that with heart focused breathing, boom, those scores rocket. Yeah. When I when I when I do exactly that, that's the time I get a hundred percent in the green the whole time. It's when I'm really connected to those emotions, coupled with the breathing and following the guidance. Yeah. I like the app too because you have various guided meditations in there it explains yeah. it easily it walks you through how to do these techniques and these practices and and actually yeah. it's really quite simple it's a loaded app i mean you have to have the sensor to use it and that's where the you know the economics come into it you buy a sensor and you know, it can be used on any mobile device you connect the sensor as you mentioned they can to your ear we have bluetooth which is universal to all the devices we have a wired sensor for the apple devices that people don't want bluetooth um, and you, you buy the sensor, you connect that, you download the app for free, and you got the super comprehensive app. It's really a training tool to train us to become more coherent, which in a sense is training us to become more heart-centered. Mm -hmm. uh, it's used in a lot of ways. I mean, it's used in healthcare, obviously. Uh, it is, I mentioned, used in athletics, um, athletic teams. We get orders in here all the time from the major sports teams, um, from their sports psychologists and all those people. Um, a lot of athletes use it. Uh, certainly people involved in uh, increasing awareness. I'll just call it personal or spiritual growth. Huge user group for that. Mm. So it's being used a lot of places. The technology, we sold sensors in over 120 countries. So it's all over the planet, you know, people using this stuff. And I think it's really cool because it's an assistive technology. I mean, technology can, can be overwhelming to us at times. What about a technology that makes us better people? Mm. Yeah. And that's what this is. And so I call it an assistive technology. And it's just an offering from HeartMath. It was born out of our research. Uh, we were doing heart rate variability research, understanding the communication that was taking place between heart, brain, and rest of the body. Once our scientists really understood it and actually became world's leaders in it, they said, wait a minute. What if we could give people the ability to, to learn how to, to work with heart rate variability to to change physiology and psychology, wouldn't that be cool? So we were again, the first ones back in ni late 1999 to re release a consumer version of heart rate variability technology. 
And that was a game changer for us. And I think for many, many people. So today millions of people have experienced it. And I think it's a, a great contribution and more to come, by the way, next time we have a show, I'll have some new ones to talk to you about. Oh, so absolutely awesome. And then with, with all the practices and everything with it, how often would you say to utilize these tools to see benefits? Well, the technology, I think, you know, well, first of all, it's difficult to prescribe because of people's lifestyles and schedules, you know, so I don't want anybody to feel boxed in. The last thing we need is something, somebody telling you, you got to do this <laughs> and add something else to your plate, you know, so find a, a, a find a, a rhythm that makes sense in your lifestyle. Uh, my suggestion would be to use it in the morning sometime if you can before the day gets going. For mm -hmm. me, that's usually about a 20 minute session. Um, in the middle of the day, I try to find five minutes here, 10 minutes there. Well, I'll just say, go sit outside, slow it down a little bit, crank up the inner balance trainer, find that place inside, clear the screen, make that connection with the heart again, shake off the business stuff and shake off all of that. It didn't take long. And then a lot of times in the evening, you know, sometimes I don't have time, but sometimes, you know, in the evening time, I'll even do maybe a longer session, just depends. Uh, so for me, it's more of a regular use, but my recommendation is find, you know, use it a couple of times a day for between five and, and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can do that, you'll start seeing some changes. It took me, it took me, I don't know how many years to finally realize that, you know, in the afternoon, two, three, four o'clock, very often I would, I would crash. And then the thing I would turn to was caffeine. And I think that's very common for many people who work long days and, and it would bring me up again a little bit, but you know, the crash would be worse after and the energy of the clarity, the focus would never be at the level that it was early in the morning. And it was just always a struggle until I finally realized that when I start feeling tired in the afternoon, what I do is I lay down for 10 to 15 minutes. I do these types of practices, meditation, connecting, breathing. And after 15 minutes, I get up and I've got energy for another four or five hours. That's and I realize I have to stop the caffeine. And it just took a habit. It took a, a recognition and a habit change. And every time now, it's like I'm just recharged the rest of the day. It's incredible. Well, you reboot your system like that. You know, and that's, that was really good that you, that you do that. Because I, I call what you call, you, you describe something very well. I call it the four o'clocks, you know, <laughs> usually not, yeah. not that good at four o'clock, right? You know, <laughs> so if I have creative things I have to do or things like interviews like today, I try to schedule those earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a, a natural biorhythm that we have. That most people would experience like that. Most people today don't take the time to try to reboot their system, the, their schedules, the speed of life, the rat race, so to speak, of life gets them on this treadmill and they just zoom. Mm -hmm. So it goes past coffee into all the caffeine drinks and everything else to try to stay jacked up. And after a while, those things do take a toll. I'm not saying it's wrong to, to drink them or do them. I drink coffee myself, but uh, if they become the dependency, if and you don't find a way to, to create some balance in your life and some other ways to regenerate those things eventually wear out. Yeah. And you know, then there's not enough red bull on the planet to get you to the next place. You know, <laughs> it's like, it just isn't going to work, you know? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, um, to, to kind of recap here a little bit, the, the techniques are, you talk about them in the book, people can go to hardmath.com, learn more about it. This device this technology this inner balance. Um, uh, device that that you have the app inside there also the app people can download for free and the processes some of the techniques and videos and things like that are in the yeah, app they're in there. Well. You, can't, you can't really use it get any scores or see your heart rate variability pattern any of that but yeah there's information inside the app you know that you can check out yeah so uh, I, I mean i encourage everyone listening go to the app store download the heart math app right now you know balance trainer Inner Balance Trainer uh, at HeartMath.com. Also, the Heart Intelligence book. This is a really yep. an incredible read. Goes into much more depth. Yeah, if there's people that. listening that want to get involved in this and share it, I mean, the way this works for us is we 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 want to equip people to share what we've got, right? So we have courses for them. And one's called the Ad Heart Facilitator Course. It's the least expensive of the bunch. It, it comes with the technology. And it trains people on a core heart math technique, some of the science, especially on the field. And then modules are short, but modules in there on how to share that. 
personally and professionally. And then the certifications go on in various levels and layers. Today, there are about eight to 10,000 people in the world that have been certified in HeartMath. And so there's a lot of amplification that happens there. And if we go back to the very beginning, why don't we do this in the first place? We were trying to assist people uh, through these changing times that were already happening and we felt we we're gonna get more intense. So we developed a simple system based around heart, based around our own experience, step by step. We unfolded it. We didn't start with a whole bunch of money and business plans and all that. We did it as a, you know, as a, a sense of mission that something we needed to do. And today we're all over the planet mm -hmm. and uh, we've amplified the, the people that we've certified. So there's a lot of opportunity to be engaged with heart math in some way, if that's something that appeals to people. And I want to say that, you know, we've never seen ourselves as competitive with other things that are out there. Uh, we, we have respect for the other systems, the other people, some of the people that are the best known folks in the field are my personal friends. There's no competition. Uh, we're just trying to add what we can. And my feeling is, is very simply said, is that I don't think you ever lose by adding heart to whatever you do. Hmm. And just adding a little heart, you, it's non-competitive. You don't, you don't lose anything and it could be a lot gained. So we're doing our part, I guess is the best way I can say it. And um, this many years in, 28 years in, I'm still as excited or more so than I was when we started. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be any ceiling on all this. It continues to unfold. and. It's been a grand adventure. Well, you guys have done an amazing job. And um, I just, I, I'm so grateful for the work that you've done in, in pioneering this and helping it spread to more people. We're, we're very hopeful that everyone tuning in gets more involved with HeartMath. Again, it's heartmath.com. All these things we talked about yeah. are there. And to, to finalize with one final question for you, Howard, we like to end with asking you, what is your number one, two, or even three quick, precise things that you would encourage people to start doing today to activate a higher level of greatness within their own lives? The first one would be, please have compassion for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting time to be alive. We're gonna have times when we disappoint ourselves. We're gonna have times we don't feel like we're good enough, that we're not getting it and all of that. When you find yourself there, uh, turn to your own heart. Recognize you're a good person doing the very best you can in this game of life. Find that place inside yourself where you give yourself the gift that you deserve of some self-compassion. The second thing I would say is begin to work on taking it step by step and reducing the judgments that we all naturally have. It's so easy to find judgment, to find things that we don't like about others or about situations, about everything. And it's so ubiquitous and so normal and natural for people to do it that it becomes a mechanical habit. The judgments that we have are one of the major blocks that we put in the way of our next levels of growth. So by learning to chip away at our judgments, learning to be more open and more allowing, I think is one of the greatest things we can do that benefits us. It also benefits the world and everybody else around us. So begin to ask you know, your own heart's intelligence to show you where you have these judgments. Uh, judgments is in this context are not things that you're discriminating. They're these sort of hardcore blocked in places where based upon prejudicial information, that's often not even right <laughs> about people, places, things, and issues. So chip away at those. Lastly, um, I would just say that step back from time to time and, and evaluate what the real essence of life is about for you. Mm -hmm because it's not always just about the doing this. It's not about, you know, for me, how many books I sell. It's not about, you know, the next interview. Uh, it's not about any of that really. When I step back and, and think about it, you know, what's, what's the purpose of life for me? And it gets simpler as I do that. So I've, the purpose that seems to be most poignant for me, and it sounds a little squishy, but I don't think that it really is in the context of which I feel it, is that I do believe that the purpose of life at the end of the day is to love. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, when it's all said and done, the measurement of whether this was a good life or not, it's going to be based around how much I loved or how much I didn't love. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, you know, identifying those key cornerstone purposes and then going back to those from time to time uh, can help keep us on track so that the, the roar of ambition and survival doesn't drown out the intuitive voice of the heart. So self-compassion, looking at the judgments, 
reevaluating what your true purpose is from time to time about what life's really about. Put those three things together and there'll be a guaranteed acceleration in your own fulfillment uh, and what you draw to you in your life. Well, my name ain't Howard Mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great life right there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Howard. Thank you for sharing this wisdom, for walking this path, and for being who you are. We, we really appreciate you and the work that Heart Math. Thanks for having me. And for you folks listening, thank these guys for having a show like this. This is their labor of love. This takes time and energy on their part to put these things on and to have an opportunity to, you know, to, to, to for you to, to, to have information uh, presented that hopefully is helpful to you. So thank you guys. Thank you, Nathan and Dirk, for, for the show and for having me on it. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Well, that's it for today's episode. Our hope and desire is that you get as much out of these interviews and episodes as we do. Each week, you can count on us being here to help you activate the greatness that's already within you. And we can all do that by continuing to develop and grow our minds, bodies, emotions, and connection to a higher purpose. Please make sure to share this with your friends on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Tag Crane Factor and use the hashtag activating greatness so we can continue growing this community together and changing the world for the better. And a huge shout out to our sponsors for making this show possible. Head over to performancetea.com to try their recovery, balance, focused, and energy teas. These teas are made from incredible healing herbal plants that help your body heal, gives you natural energy, helps prevent disease, and help you feel better in every way. Again, that's Performance T, that's T E A, Performance T.com, and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount off your order. That code works on their website and it also works on Amazon. Again, ACTIVATE15, and you'll get a 15% discount off of these amazing teas. We appreciate you tuning in and for supporting our sponsors who make this show possible. Remember, you already have greatness within you. You just need to activate it. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.